Hey everybody, welcome. I hope you all have really lovely weekends. Hello and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 760th New Social Environment. I'm Eleanor, a programs associate here at the Rail, and today I have the immense pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation featuring Arya Dean and Mackenzie Wark. We are thrilled to, thrilled to welcome poet Kay Alato McDowell here to close today's program. Before we get started, the Brooklyn Rail acknowledges Black Lives Matter. Here in New York, we are on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Chinookock Indian Nation. We recognize land acknowledgments are not a replacement for necessary decolonial work, but they serve as a reminder of place, a reminder of the legacies of dispossession and enslavement that sustain and enrich the stolen land we are speaking from. And now to introduce today's guest and host, New York-based artist and writer Aria Dean has created a multi-platform body of work based in entrenchment techniques of representational systems. Recent solo and two-person exhibitions and performances include the Renaissance Society, Chicago, Red Cat, Los Angeles, and Green Naftali, New York. Dean's book, Bad Infinity, Selected Writings from MIT Press will be published in August, 2023. And Mackenzie Wark, our host today, is the author of Reverse Cowgirl, among other things. And her book, Raving, was published this year by Duke University Press and I think is coming out next week, if I'm right about that. So congratulations, Mackenzie. Um, and I'm thrilled to pass it over to you. Thank you. Both so much for joining the MSC today. Thank you, Eleanor, and my thanks to the rail. This you've done over 600 of what, what? I don't know. I just don't even know how that's possible. It's a wonderful institution that uh, we're part of again. Hi, Aria. How are you doing? Hi, I'm good. How are you? And thank you also for having me. I'm excited to be here. Um, yeah, I'm good. How are you, Mackenzie? Good. I don't think we've met in the real world, have we? I don't think so. I kind of, it's kind of funny. I feel like in some way, yeah, I was kind of like, wow, of anyone who I haven't actually met in real life, it's almost, I think it might be the wildest to me that we've never actually. That, um, that was kind of, kind of strange, you know, it's like the, the pinball machine of kind of yeah. life hasn't thrown us together, but uh, I've been aware of your work for uh, a long time and it's a pleasure to, to get to talk to you about it today. Uh, and we're here mostly to talk about uh, the new work, Abattoir USA. I wanted to just back up a little bit and ask you about a couple of things that uh, are just sort of like little personal favorites of mine in your body of work. And, and the first is a video work called Sweet with an exclamation mark. So I sort of want to say like, sweet, you know, like with a little bit of <laughs> emphasis and, and maybe the other sense of it. Um, and it, it it's sort of, um, besides having like these dancing tree creatures that are a little... Um, like to me they're like five percent disturbing and 90 percent charming and adorable and and i want to be their friend you know um but there's sort of like a little manifesto that could be the trees talking you know over the top of it and i just wanted to pull out some phrases and uh ask you about that particular piece um and the the voice is talking about the uh the total inconstancy of all reality as an overwhelming image uh and later talks about having been accused of being a, a sophist um of new and false gods and it's like yes let's do that uh, a, a bird catcher trying to capture splendor and glory uh which struck me as you know like one component perhaps of a uh of an of an aesthetic maybe uh mm. and i wonder if that's how you saw it and saw you know the the function of that work yeah, um, yeah, I mean, I think that work was in this way, uh, kind of, so the voice is, it's me doing the voiceover and the, like, the, a lot of the text that you just quoted, especially the the latter portion is um, Giordano Bruno, uh, who was like, yeah, you know, this like philosopher who was um, killed for like heresy um, and basically like, you know, suggested that rather like there is, I'm not going to butcher this to some degree, but, you know, at the time of the Copernican revolution suggested that rather than there being one, you know, heliocentric, whatever, like 
solar system that there was like actually like infinite worlds and infinite universes and that you know kind of and so it's kind of this like you know and and he's someone who a lot of like like early like 70s video artists refer to him so there's a kind of thread in like artistic practices that throw anyway but um I think that piece overall yeah was kind of this like a bit of a manifesto kind of yeah this like bricolage text of like my own writing and then like not just Bruno but like people like Heidegger and Bataille and like other thinkers that have kind of haunted or like watched over like the you know writing and, and making that I've done um and yeah and I think like in the in the video itself so yeah these plants are like dancing and there's this like you know weird kind of it's like this voiceover and then also this kind of bedroom pop kind of like thing that I made with my friend Evan who did the music for the avatar project as well and it's kind of was meant to be, yeah, this like kind of totalizing space of aria or something kind of like rather than, and I, cause I know a lot of the work I've made, I've approached in this very like removed and like analytical appearing kind of like, you know, aesthetic, like sensibility, very like, minimal, et cetera. And I kind of was like, okay, like this is like a pivot point maybe where I'm going to start making video work or film work that is more like, like this is my vibe or something. Um, and so the sort of and then like yeah the like and I think that the title suite was supposed to be kind of this yeah like it's like a suite of anyway and, and I guess like yeah it's sort of like this like dancing kind of sweet but then like the sort of like dude where's my car style like yeah like sweet bro like kind of like you know having and also sweet like so and I think that I'm interested in it was kind of the first attempt I think in video format to sort of mark out my priorities I think like as a like filmmaker or video artist or something beyond just like analyzing the functions of film and video um yeah so yeah and that's that's sort of an interesting moment yeah when 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 and how can one move from uh a practice that's uh critical of how representation works to then doing something other than it and it, to me that's so it seems like that moment in your work to me a little bit of mm -hmm. like the declaration that that becomes the project it's like all right so uh we're not gonna represent the world because we can't what else can we do yeah no definitely and I think like I think also at a certain point I became really I was getting frustrated with you know the tools at hand I think in terms of like yeah making work that like critique or un critique or unpacked like those questions it was kind of like you know I was I kept making this joke and it's more about sculpture but it's like one can only make like mirrored cubes and other such like you know minimal forms for butts along without becoming completely I mean at least for me becoming completely bored by it um and so and I think I have a real like desire I have a real interest in like popular cinema popular media and like art being fun and interesting or like having like some sort of affect I guess and so um yeah I really yeah I think it was a shift in that regard and I think as well like yeah kind of like I think trying to and using the plants was like okay well here's a way to have like figures that are not human and but that like you know and kind of trying to put inject myself into the work without representing myself I guess and so creating a space that was kind of like and, and, and honestly also like the way that installation is modeled creating a space that feels kind of authoritarian and it's like architectonics or whatever and like kind of you know this booming like Wizard of Oz voice that's just me kind of like you know piecing together these musings um yeah so I I, I agree with with that <laughs> with what you're saying about it um it's, it's, uh a doorway in this one and also then in uh the the new work as well there's a moment where we pass through a door mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if what the repeating of that little image mm -hmm. any, yeah. thoughts, any thoughts on that yeah I think um I mean it's funny I think they're kind of like probably I forgot that there's the door moment in, in suite as well but I think that it is I think I like, I get, I mean, in sculpture as well, I'm really interested in like, the idea of like the set, I think, and kind of like, you know, the scene, the scenario and producing, you know, even in with Sweet, like producing the exhibition space as part of the set of the video, like in the video, it's like, you know, you're, you're watching a version of the space that you're in and there are these plants occupying it. And then you're just like, you know, it's kind of this like nested um, architecture. And I think that then like kind of creating like 
yeah, back, like the, you know, in that film, you go backstage and then you're like with the plant backstage and kind of creating these like through lines where you're on set or offset backstage, on stage, like on screen, off screen, and, and confusing the the relationship between the two. And then I think in the Avatar film, I mean, we can get more into it, I guess, but I think the doors are also, I don't know if they function in the same way. I think that whole film has this sort of like, play or it's sort of like dancing with or, or playing with or like evading a sort of idea of transcendence that I think is not is sort of like often culturally associated with death and like there is this like kind of extended like death moment in it and then the doors do open after that and but then like they open and you're just kind of in another part of the same space and it's and it's got a at least at least I think a sort of imminent like relationship to what precedes death moment so maybe it kind of like I don't know it might have a different sort of philosophy of the the, the filmic space than the than Sweet did um and Sweet definitely was conceived of as more of like a dance film and more of like more theatrical and this one I think is more like staunchly like thinking of itself as as cinema in a way but yeah before we get to it, I just want to ask you about a piece of writing of yours that I really admire, and that's the Black Bataille uh, essay and the connection in that between uh, how Blackness has come to be thought in mm -hmm. Afro-pessimism and Bataille's kind of like truly extreme but kind of liberating materialism or commitment to the impossibility of materialism. I just, just wonder how if that's found its way into your work as well that that sort of connection yeah definitely yeah I think that um so I mean for those who are not familiar I guess um the Black Bataille piece I wrote it's in November magazine um which Mackenzie has been interviewed by and I'm uh one of the editors of but like um it kind of yeah I tried it was trying to work through this I mean often I think the things I write are just trying to work through like some sort of weird like crossover that I noticed between two lines of thinking and then sort of seeing what kind of um I, I used to call it like, like non-consensual like smashing together of like schools of thought can happen so um I'd been interested in Bataille for a while in large part through like the Rosalind Krauss and Yvelon Blois like formlessness um long form sort of more like yeah like like you know using Bataille as a way in Tarsus practices um and also just had other like kind of moments in my uh you know like academic experiences in college where I was, you know, we're really also like when I was much younger trying to read Bataille and like really failing to read Bataille, just be like, I don't really understand what's going on here. But um I anyway, there's this little bit in Bataille where he talks about like just he 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 directly talks about blackness um in relationship to base materialism and in relationship to a sort of politics re related to base materialism. And I had already at a point like kind of like just noticed some resonances between you know, certain Afro-pessimist thinkers or people who like might get associated with Afro-pessimism such as um, R.A. Judy and like, you know, like, and it's even in Wilders and whatever, even this idea of like non-productive expenditure in Bataille obviously relates to sort of like surplus populations as well as like, you know, the way that Wilderson and others figure blackness as like inherently and outside that it reinforces the inside. So I was like, well, it was like an obvious, like something to, not obvious, but, like something to like work with here. And so I wrote this essay kind of trying to look at um, certain artistic practices primarily using Bataille to sort of extend like how to think about um, certain like black artist practices as well as like maybe not just that but bridging like Robert Morris kind of ended up in there too somehow <laughs> and so like kind of just like how also maybe in a way like how can like you know in and it was really I guess a critique of Krauss and um, and Yvonne Blois too in terms of like the limitations of how they I think of the formless like the formless in, in art but then all that research maybe opened on to this other sort of thing about um, Bataille's like little piece about the slaughterhouse that's like really really short that just kind of you know where he talks about the slaughterhouse being a space of the production of that boundary of like you know if a slaughterhouse is put outside of the city or like is kind of like hidden away um, but this work that happens there like animal slaughter like reinforces um, society and you know sort of this like keeps the the profane uh, outside and then Wilderson also uses the slaughterhouse in his writing as um, an analogy metaphor I'm kind of like struggling with like 
sort of the the I'm I'm becoming very like I'm like metaphor allegory analogy and like I don't know quite how because I think basically he says that like the slaughterhouse he uses a lot of slaughterhouse to talk about how um you know he basically says like just as we are not surprised that cows are killed in slaughterhouses we should not be surprised that black people are killed in America because it's an architecture or conceptual architecture that's built for that very purpose um so I kind of like got I was interested in that cross section and that kind of is where the abattoir work started but um I don't know, it's like beyond the, the, the bounds of your question, Mackenzie, but just, so I think there's like this, I think there's a ripe territory for crossovers. And I think there's like so much, there's so many batailles and like so much batai that I don't even know if that even scratches the surface um, of everything that could be done. But the black batai piece just tried to kind of like, working with what I had at my disposal, um, like Robert Morris and like David Hammonds and Rosalind Krauss, I kind of tried to make an argument about. Yeah, I never read the Krauss and Dubois book and I feel like now I don't have to, but. <laughs> it's a great, it's really, it's an interesting, I like it. It's just not very like, it just suffers from the sort of like, it's like sits at the period and like both of their, or like at least Krauss to me, like it sits in this moment where it's like, they're like both so staunchly modernist in their approach, but also like there's obviously this like postmodernist and post-structuralist impulse in the work. And so even like the very writing of this book where they're like, formlessness like let's make room for like the lumpy the goopy the like you know kind of less like you know less classically modernist appearing work in our framework but it doesn't really work because then they're kind of just reincorporating it into you know the existing frame or to, I don't know it's just kind of like basically it's that they just like aestheticize this concept in Bataille that's like kind of really meant to like not result in like an aesthetic approach and then also at this and to your question about the influencing my work like the whole show I did at Green Enough Tolly um in 2021 was like very much like trying to do some sort of like formlessness thing um in sculpture without making blobs um entirely so I don't know if that was yeah but. which does bring us to uh Abattoir USA and uh, I don't know if, if Chloe or uh, Eleanor has the slide set for that. And this is the installation uh, at the, the Ren in Chicago at the moment. Uh, and these are stills from a video. So if you maybe just sort of step us through it so we can see. Uh, Ari, anything you want to tell us as we sort of look at them to give people a little, little mm -hmm. glimpse? So, yeah, so it's, yeah, I mean, it's a single channel installation or it's like a 10 minute long video for film or film video I don't know it has credits so maybe film um like beginning a title card and ending but and then the floors are like rubber mats um like non-slit mats that you would find in a slaughterhouse um there's like a low like a six foot wall you can kind of see there uh that surrounds you in the space um and then Oh, it's like eight channel sound so it's like pretty like it's a pretty like highly developed yeah like surround sound system um that Evan the composer I worked with uh or designed and then I guess behind you at this where if you're looking at it from this vantage behind you there's a pair of doors that match the doors that um I think maybe it's the next slide yeah so like those doors like there's there are doors that are the same behind like what that you go through to enter this space so that's like you know um, but yeah, I think that's all the deep, the basic stuff. Oh, and also, it's, sorry, the whole thing is is made in Unreal Engine, um, so it's all animated, it's all simulated in Unreal Engine, and it's a um, a recording of that of that simulation. And I'm not, I'm not amazing at talking about the technical implications of that, but essentially, it is something that could be shown as a real time simulation, not as a quote unquote like film. So that's something that. Um, we thought of a lot about in the sweet project that we talked about earlier was also simulated but it was made in unity and yeah but a similar process um yeah yeah and there's there's a, a sound environment that goes with this which i've only heard in in through my headphones i haven't uh, haven't had the experience of it and the the floor has this sort of damp slightly you know sort of dark thing going on as well as maybe another detail uh, in, in the floor inside the video yes maybe another detail to point out yeah um I mean it makes me think of um Upton Sinclair's book The Jungle if you know that one about um the meatpacking business which was in Chicago yeah 
Mm. Uh, yeah. fun, fun, fun fact, my relatives migrated to Australia, not the United States because of that book. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh my God, that sounds awful. Let's go somewhere else. <laughs> Wow. And, and these move a little bit there's like little bits of movement yeah mm -hmm. yeah yeah so like there's yeah so in this the final scene there's like the floor is basically made of blood or sort of a reflective red surface um that suggests blood in that scene and then the hooks are kind of like and like it's kind of the soundscape is like very like it's a pretty like ambient sort of oriented score um until the ending scene where there's like this cover and it's I don't know how much to like reveal or not reveal but I feel like because like not everyone is gonna make it to Chicago I feel like it's okay to to blow the the surprise <laughs> at the end there's um yeah this like cover of I think we're alone now um that like song that most people associate with Tiffany the 80s artist but it's actually also like there's a 1950s version that is what we were using but um and yeah, it's like a cover where there's like a sort of duet between a cello played by Nikki Weatherall um, and then a cow mooing that we made out of like, kind of made like a instrument out of some field recordings of, of a cow, but it's like really processed. So it gets kind of like, I don't know, like bittersweet. And I don't know, I mean, people, I, people, obviously I have my own relationship to it, which maybe isn't as, I don't, I'm not as like freaked out because I've been just been staring at it for um, a year or so, but it's like this kind of weird, ending like energy wise I don't know how, how others experience it but it's like kind of I think like funny and sweet and sad and and kind of disturbing for all those reasons but um yeah and and to me that's where it, like it sort of fulfills a bit of that promise from sweet of putting that all of those affects together and mm -hmm. uh in and it's not it's the relation between the affects that's disturbing to me more than anything else. And yeah, because at the end, I'm just like, oh, I, I like this, but wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. Where have we just come from through the through the doors? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I It also reminds me of this, there's this other version of modernism, which is like Siegfried Gideon's Mechanization Takes Command, which is all about how like the slaughterhouse is modernity. Mm -hmm. Is this like, other version of it that's sort of like just absent from a lot of sort of art world discourse? Yeah. And what if I went back and looked at that, you know? Yeah, that was kind of so the, the sort of germ of the project was so that there was the whole like Bataille and Wilderson thing. And then alongside that, I guess like I it's hard to even remember how I got, but then I started just like researching, I guess, like Slaughterhouse has like architectural typology and like trying to see like what so I, I really like have a sort of a long time love for architectural theory. Like I wanted to be an architect when I was in undergrad and just was like not interested in like learning the sort of nuts and bolts elements that go with that but I did a lot of architectural theory and like that was kind of my focus I guess in in school um but so I guess I yeah, I was interested in like this I basically started going back into like Gideon and and other like you know stuff from that time and and basically sort of lighted upon that exact thing where like he talks about slaughterhouse as being this major part of modernity and then like just in the sort of conversation, sort of like baby birding of like architectural forms back and forth between Europe and the US, the slaughterhouse is actually like quite a prominent like point of conversation around like, you know, the appropriate nature of ornamentation or like, you know, like sort of like in France, there was like a lot of conversation around whether or not there should be any ornamentation on slaughterhouses and that kind of like just like prefigured the sort of conversation like, you know, ornament and crime. And so there's these weird things where, like the slaughterhouse becomes like, you know, or even like Upton Sinclair, like, not so much I say architecturally, but architecture and politics there like becomes like a really important touchstone in the like kind of, you know, like in terms of generating like modernity and also like modernist architecture. Um, or like for instance, like like Rebusier is like first um like for design prize that he won apparently it was like kind of like a little bit washed from the archive but if you like you can google it but like it was for an abattoir and then he repurposed the design for like later like housing projects so it's like there's this weird and I think sort of also I so basically I got interested in the, the like reinserting and, and revisiting the slaughterhouse and you know you know drawing on Gideon also like Gramsci has like some really interesting stuff as well about it and um person notebooks like revisiting that seems like it would recontextualize modernism um in some interesting ways that I think like might connect it further more to death than to like any sort of will to life and I think makes room for like makes things like you know 
fascist aesthetics, et cetera, like less like aberration, no, no, but kind of they're really baked into some of the conversations. Um, anyway, so then that's why I got the Graham Foundation grant to do research around that as a part of this project. So there'll be this book that we're doing that will kind of go into that as well. It also makes me think of uh, the killing floor as a figure in uh, blues music mm -hmm. and all these different, I mean, and often men literally there because a lot of people would do that kind of labor, like this labor is available to black men. Yeah. Um, also killing floor is a state of existence. I can see it from the point of view. Right. And I think that that kind of like, in, you know, it goes back to the Wilderson. I think that what I got, I think something that was, like formally speaking at issue in making the work and and kind of in why the slaughter because I mean I don't really have any like particularly vested interest in like the slaughterhouse as such like beyond like these things but like got really interested in like okay the slaughterhouse like even what you're saying it's like a literal material like site let's say that like you know a human being might be like occupying and then is drawing from but then also it's got this like metaphorical charge or allegorical charge but then trying to treat it in this way that like, you know, I guess I'd also, I'm really interested in like materialist and structural film. So kind of trying to treat it as like simply itself, like not like algorizing it in the, through the narrative of the video, just like, here's the thing, but then kind of asking myself, asking the audience, asking everyone involved, like at what point does like allegory or like you know or just simply even like the impact of looking at this space like at what point does that come sweeping in and then draw it outside of itself and I haven't figured out how to speak like particularly intelligently about this yet because it's like feels like this really intense knot but basically like and I also I, like, like kind of there's this idea of like okay like there's just it's this place where all this like actual material activity is happening where like for instance like the line between the human and the animal is being drawn and redrawn by like killing animals and saying like, well, we're separate from that. Like we kill animals, we're not allowed to kill humans or whatever. And then also the line between humans and machines and animals like is being like reinforced and blurred. But then also the line between the material and the symbolic is kind of getting like confused alongside that in, in the space where kind of like the space is like generating actual material processes that affect the world, but then also generating like symbolic meaning in some way, but trying to treat it in a way that like Kind of like holds it like in in its place or something I don't know but it's kind of and I don't know if it does or doesn't do that because I've again been sitting with it for so long and I also don't know like quite what the implications of even trying to do that are but I just know that was like something that was yeah. important to me yeah yeah and yeah I immediately have two thoughts from this one comes out of that Black Batai essay to do with how um, materialist film tended to make the apparatus of cinema itself the limits of the materialism it could deal with and uh, this in a way uses um, you know a kind of uh, form of simulation to get us even past that point you know to this kind of something like a base materialism in the Thai sense and I, I, that's sort of really refreshing to me to have this other path mm. back to um, modernity and now I've completely forgotten what the second thing was but maybe <laughs> maybe one thing I think what you're saying yeah I think like that kind of trying to figure out like I mean in some ways it's like what are the limits of materialism is kind of maybe the the thing that uh, is something something that I'm preoccupied with and I think like with with film or cinema that has been something like I've been like reading for like years and years and years not years but like for a while now I've been like kind of obsessively re doing readings in like materialist like film history or you know materialist approaches to film and like emailing like old film critics being like what do we do like what is you know materialist film after the, the digital like blah, blah, blah. and like because I don't like so you know if the material you know the whole that all that whole line of thinking was based on yeah, the idea of like film stock light like you know space whatever but it's like well okay if we're like shooting on digital or if like there are other ways of producing you know or vernacular like cinema is like produced with like iphones whatever like what actually is the material and, and you know i spent a lot of time writing about like circulation of moving images but in some ways i was i think i've kind of now moved back like okay but like the production of a moving image like what's it what's uh i don't know yeah like what is like compelling in terms of um a materialism in relation to this and I don't know that like shooting in Unreal Engine is necessarily like the sole way through that it actually really was just like a solution to a problem which was that we couldn't get access to a slaughterhouse like I wanted to just shoot in a real one but like 
no one would allow me into any. So um, it became more convenient and the only way to like image the space. So I don't know, but I think, yeah. And then I think also the question of like, how does material, like how does, I think also, I guess like the idea of like a black materialism or a black materialist film, which I don't think there is a singular, there's no way there could be a singular conception of that, but like something that I've also tried to write about. I wrote this essay about Arthur J. F. a few years ago where I tried to apply like a lot of like Peter Godal and, and Peter Wool and stuff about like materialist film to his work and kind of asking like, okay, like if we agree, if we acknowledge that like race is a material reality in some way or like has like a relationship to the material world or if blackness, let's say, has a relationship to the material world, like how does it insert itself into like an actual actual material conception of the moving image and not just as like a as a symbolic or conceptual layer that sits atop that material. Um, and again, I don't know the answer. And I think that this film has moved away from like that particular question in some way, but it is trying to like model some like insertion of, I don't know, or like play with with uh, symbolic in a way that might try to unpack it. I don't, I don't, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it gets us away. <laughs> from you know like the trap of representation and which always seems to me to entail a kind of an idealism and that to me is Bataille's point about it mm -hmm. uh, but it seems to me that there's you know like uh, uh, a, a metonymic sideways chain from the automation of killing pigs to the automation of producing images is sort of like one history and it mm -hmm. seems to me that even if it was accidental that it ends up being made in Unreal Engine, it, it kind of closes the the loop in that history of mm -hmm. you know, things that have been automated. Yeah. Uh, and I think also like with the question of automation, like I think the, you know, like even like, you know, there's it's still pretty hard to entirely automate animal slaughter from what I've been reading and, and what I've heard, like people, someone has to be there to like do something. And so the sort of the idea that like, even I don't know like how like sort of the, the margin by which you're kind of like people are still like in the corner and like you know in the automated world and then also like with something like this like Philip Costa who did all the the simulation work like you know watching him do it it's like an incredibly in, engaging and like interpretive and like creative process and so like this idea that like and even when I approached him about working on it I have this idea that we would like build like a totalized, like a total slaughterhouse and then just like shoot within it. And he was like, that doesn't make any sense. Like we need to build sets of each of the spaces that you want, you know, and it's in the same way that you would make a movie where you would never build like an entire slaughterhouse on a soundstage, you know, you might shoot a location, but you would never like build that whole thing out. Mm. So it kind of like the, the, my understanding of what like virtual production is or requires was actually quite different from, like, it's so much more just, it's just the same thing in some way as like, um, you know, real production, but then also like, I think crucially, I mean, the, fir the first person point of view of the video also, I think was hugely important going into it. And I think that then shooting it in Unreal came really weird too, because the way you like use a camera in that program is really different from like, you're not like, unless you have like a rig added to it, like you're just like keyframing camera movements as though you're keyframing like time, like, you know, edits in like a, in like a, you know, whatever. So it's like, the, the camera is objectified in a in a weird way or you're just dropping cranes into like space and then moving the crane like it's you know a marble or something so you know it's very stra strange way to work I think but I, I can I can see you writing about the making of work like this at some point <laughs> wow. yeah, yeah I hope to I mean I think and I think also it's like this is the first time I've worked with with Philip and you know Evan and I have done a number of projects together where he's done the sound but this is the first time we all work together and also Andy my assistant who was hugely like you know he basically produced it like I think that the like we were like okay we're gonna do this again but we're gonna do it like at like a feature scale um and also incorporate like actors into it and shoot like people against these backdrops and see how it looks because it's totally possible you know how like Mandalorian and that stuff is like made this way basically so it's like um, yeah 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 and you've you've written scripts for actors before yeah you've done yeah done um yeah I think yeah I've done like I did this play a few years ago now that was um at CAC in Geneva or kind of like it's yeah, I wrote it for a thing at Swiss Institute and then it kind of 
took on different formats until it kind of found its final form there. And then this project in COVID at the Hammer, King of the Loop. And then like I have kind of, yeah, like a side uh, or sort of a secret life um, as a screenwriter, <laughs> screenwriter um, and more like kind of popular uh, arenas um, that's like kind of, I don't know, like, which is, you know, really fun to pair with all of this like, you know, weirder kind of um, work. But I like, yeah, I like writing for actors. And I mean, in some ways this was really hard because there was no, we didn't write a script at all. There was just like kind of a scenario, I guess, in a way of like images I wanted to see. And I did like a storyboard, but um, it was, I think it made it really hard for Evan, for instance, who was composing, but it, there was no, like, he was like, you know, over here in one black box and like Philip was over here in another black box and they didn't really get to like, because there wasn't like an object that we were working from so much. So I do really like scripts, even if there aren't people, but I also really love working with actors. It's like, and in some ways this was like, like, I don't know, there's something that felt like it was so fun to do, but I felt like the part that for me was missing, yeah, was the sort of like, you know, that kind of um, person to person engagement. So. Yeah, what, how, how much do you think collaboration is a part of how you work and how much is it, you know, like a, a solo? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I so prefer, like in making work, I think like I, everything I do is very collaborative. Even like the sculptures I make, it's like, it requires like, like I don't do the 3D modeling myself and then it's fabricated. So I'm like constantly like in contact with like a team of at least like, I think three people total, you know? And I think that, and I really like that. I think I think through conversation better than I do. I mean, I like to like, I like to read alone. I like to write alone. I like to, you know, conceptualize. Like there's a lot of stuff that happens like over here, but in the production of work, it really means a lot to me to work with other people. And, and I think also to work with them in like, truly collaborative ways or I try to try my very hardest to like make sure because it's just like I don't know I don't it's not that fun to especially with something like this with like film and video it's like I always think it's funny or tragic I suppose in a way that like when we talk about film and video in the art world it like has a sort of like it remains with a lot of time in this like the artist has singular producer when like there's a whole industry where like we know that it takes so many people to make anything and like any you know film work barring like yeah like found footage you're just like do whatever probably someone like helped you do it or there was someone you were talking to so I really like acknowledging those relationships and also I think like having that be part of the I don't know like very much part of the, the creative process um and like I don't know like my parents are both in film production so I think it comes from like that just being the world that I grew up in but um I don't know because I think art making work can be so lonely and so it's like nice to um and I just don't think like I personally don't think that I am at my sharpest when I'm in a vacuum on my own that, that, that doesn't really birth that much that's that interesting um but yeah well I, the the thing that would would you know sort of contradict that is is your volume of work as a writer and and there's a uh a, a Another, and I imagine more extensive collection of your writing coming out later this year with Sternberg. Yeah, what's it called again? I've forgotten the title. Uh, it's Bad Infinity. Bad Infinity. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and the, how do you see the the practice of of writing? What what to me is media theory. You might think of it as as something else, as connected to your other practices. Yeah. I mean, I think like, I mean, it's been funny. Yeah, the Sternberg book has been an interesting opportunity to like, you know, try to understand like I wrote an introduction for it and I was like really I wrote like a, a acknowledgments and it was like so excruciating in some way because I was just kind of like god like what is that you know it's like well, that stuff that's in there spans from like 2016 to like 2023 and I was not to be like eh, but I was like 22 23 and 2016 so it's like it's like reading you know I don't think it's like dumb writing but it's a really specific I can feel myself in it in a way that's like oh my god like I can't believe I published this and everyone read it and like saw me freaking out in public or something but um I think that yeah I mean I do think I view it as something like media theory I don't totally know I think like primarily like whatever it is it's definitely like all like artists writings and I think that there are periods of that writing that like I was frustrated I, I I can there was frustration about like not being certain if it was being received as that because everything I wrote was very much like 
in the service of some problem I felt like I needed to solve for like my studio practice. Um, and of course my studio practice is also expanded. It, you know, it's, it's other forms of writing. It's like sculpture, it's like film and video, but um, yeah, I don't know. I think that, but I also think that a lot of it, like most of the stuff in there was, you know, was written in, in conversation with others in like really major ways. Like even thinking about like, like the, there's a, I think it's in there like unsovereignty, this thing I wrote for Spike that was kind of like right in, towards the beginning of COVID. Like that came out of like, I have this reading group with some friends that's been, we've been doing it for on and off for like five years and we were reading Necropolitics and it was kind of like, you know, my like homework, <laughs> not, not homework, but kind of just like, you know, the, the sort of like, yeah, runoff from that. And like, you know, Black Bataille was very much in conversation with like, you know, we were doing this lawn form issue for November. And so Emmanuel, who, you know, is the founding editor and a really good friend of mine, like we were talking a lot about that stuff. And so I think that it's, you know, and then also like different curate, like with the the final piece in the book, Channel Zero, that was written for the Signal show that just opened at MoMA and like Stuart and Michelle were like super, super like, you know, it took me like three years to write because it's like about like police brutality clips and like I started writing it in 2019 and then like you know all there's so much happened and like you know we, the sort of dialogue we had so I don't know I think like even in writing though in getting it done it's like a solitary pursuit it definitely all the writing that I've done I think is run through like so much conversation with others um but yeah I don't know or like the Robert Morris thing this like lecture I did on Robert Morris like that's like yeah, like so many conversations like aggregated into into that. Um, but yeah, I don't know. And I think, yeah, it's like, but I, but I do think it's like the writing is, I remember in college, like some, like a professor was like, you know, you're really like, you should, we had to write artist statements or something. And he was like, you really should mention your writing and your artist statement. Like it's so crucial to your practice. And I was like, how dare you? <laughs> like, I'm not a writer, I'm an artist. And I think that there was a huge like, I don't know, at a certain point, maybe also just like historically, and I think it persists now, but it's just like this thing where writer or artist, writer or artist, like it's kind of like being an artist who writes, I feel like there was like a lot of, I, I have ongoing identity crisis with that, but now kind of have like maybe just gotten over it by forcing myself to, but. um. Yeah, I, I don't know. And, and I it seems to be a particularly American thing that artists shouldn't be writers, you know, like the, the idea of the sort of like the, the the non linguistic dumb genius artist kind of thing is yeah. like it's yeah sort of, I, I understand it as a constraint because it's so common but be, Which be I think so like, over that. yeah and I think going back to sweet it kind of like that work almost was kind of because I think also like if you do write as an artist or in my experience writing as an artist it's like then it means that you're like you know, one, the work is il illustrative of like whatever conclusions you've come to, like, you know, I, the number of times like my writing, you know, like about like memes has been used to like describe like what I'm doing with sculpture. And I'm like, come on, it's like, it's not one-to-one. -one. Like, of course these things are related and I can't deny that, but like, you can't like consider this, you know, yeah, like a, a proof of concept for that writing. But also I think that, um, that just like, there's like something that like, if you write that like, supposedly you're writing from like an analytical and like distanced perspective when really like I think for me everything I've written has been like I'm like standing in the center of like you know or somewhere in a storm and I'm like oh my gosh like what's that like ah and like I think that um in some way I don't know like sweet maybe like was for me it just like unleashed kind of just like opened the box and just like <laughs> and like kind of like but whatever came out um into that into that work and maybe with avatar it's like a little more organized or it's kind of a little good maybe it is a bit more analytical again because I think there are like new questions that I'm trying to answer about like but it's also like even like really with that one it's like yeah it's like okay, I've been writing about like in some ways like that this work and the signals essay have a strong relationship to one another where it's like okay like what happens when you take out the concept of like the subject in the frame or something like that in a certain scenario that's like mostly concerned with killing I don't know but um but yeah but it is a weird thing that people just expect that you were not going to want to think about things in the with the written word as an artist it's like 
Yeah, I mean, there's there's a line in in Sweet that's how do you do a character study of no one, and that that seemed to me to be, uh, which is yeah, how 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 do you do a character study of subjectivity itself? Yeah, right, exactly. Yeah, and there's like kind of yeah, and I think that was yeah, because I think it's like yeah, this question like okay, like if I want to make like I do want to make, and I am making like narrative projects that do concern, let's say at the very least like, let's say a black woman protagonist who like inevitably then by by the, the logic of all of these things that I've immersed myself in is not really like a proper subject so then like how do you like like yeah like literally how would I do a character study of someone who is in like some conceptual sense like nobody um and or like you know the play that I did years ago it was kind of the inverse or it took like four like young white like kind of like yuppie hipster types and like ran them through this like weird like meat grinder almost and and kind of was like okay how do I make this into how do I make this like dinner party scene into a character study of no one when like they're all like proper subjects or something like how do I like unravel them um but yeah I mean there's a lot of stuff that I'm like thinking about now that like re reading a lot of like Catherine Malibu and like stuff on like plasticity and there's like some great um you know stuff about like George Eliot in relationship to that so I've been reading Middlemarch very slowly trying to oh, like yeah see how it might you know dovetail some of these things but but yeah um yeah it's uh, I just remember Virginia Woolf saying that was the first novel for grown-ups it really is <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah it's it's a shame that like it's always that trap of representation as if like your art is supposed to represent the writing in some sense and uh, mm -hmm. which is connected to the phenomena of the subject but then you know what what about humans for whom subjectivity is not even available Right. Uh, or is always on the question um, yeah. where where blackness would be the central figure of that uh, yeah. or not figure of that in, in our context yeah. yeah I think at the same time too trying to like not lose and you know I think in the pursuit of that like pursuit of like modeling that kind of practice or like really leaning into the like anti-subjectivity whatever line of thinking you know I really do think I did paint myself into a corner after a certain point and I was like stuck making like mirrors <laughs> and I was like ah like and so I think like also trying to find a way to remain critically engaged remain theoretic have it have a theoretically engaged practice but also be expressive and I think that that's when it's like you know okay even if I don't understand subjectivity to be like properly formulated in the way like mine you know anyone else's like to be what we claimed it was like I still do like I have, I have to admit my own desire to like make things that excite me and that like are cool or interesting are like fun to watch or sad or you know whatever like affecting in, in some way and I think that that's kind of been the last like year or two kind of the question that I'm like kind of like how and also just how to draw you know like things like materialist film structural film things like minimalism how do you draw those into the present um, or like the, the sort of concepts that they give us that are very important? Like, how do you draw those into the present without having to make quicker films for the rest of your life? <laughs> like, like, and also because we don't really need, like, I don't, I don't think we really just need more like, yeah, like just straight up Paul Sherritt's or like just straight up Michael Snow. We need like things that are like working with those in like new ways. Um, and there are a million different ways to do that, you know, I don't know. So, and, and experimenting with, with the, the lessons that they've, they've given us. Yeah. But to me, that was what was so delightful about watching Sweet and then Abattoir of, of sort of, I, I wouldn't say painting yourself into a corner, but it's sort of like those, those moments in like a, a jazz solo where you're kind of like, how are you getting out of that to somewhere else? <laughs> like, you know, like it was Coltrane. It's like, you went, you did it like that, you know, like that. <laughs> that's the joy of it so it's, it's been a real pleasure to engage with, with both those works and uh particularly with Avatar because there's a lot of ways um having to go as far into the sort of simulated world of what uh contemporary video technology will do in order to literally render uh the place where flesh is rendered in that other sense yeah uh, struck mm -hmm. me as kind of like well that's a move like this this sort of gets your work uh, yeah, draw some of these traditions into the present. Mm -hmm. uh, we all love Michael Snow, but it's we it's we don't need to do it again. You know, like how is how can that resonate? Yeah, uh, yeah, and I think always just like how can I think too like uh, at an early early point I like you know I remember I'm I don't know I've always I've I've 
I like art history and I think I like make a lot of work that is like, you know, like winks at art histories in, in ways. And I think also like work that slurps up like art history or, or something. It sounds so gross, but like, I don't know, like I remember I made some stuff that was like using Ad Reinhardt quotes like a long time ago. And like, and often I've, people have been like, oh, you're like taking on art history is like fucked up, whatever. And I'm like, honestly, no, I think I'm just like, I'm like, like, thank you. Like, thank you. Thank you. And just kind of, then I, I hope like taking, you know, as much as I can from anywhere I, I want to take it. And I think maybe like that's, you know, I, one could, you know, maybe view that as like some sort of like weird, like not master's tools kind of perspective, but just kind of like, just kind of even actually experimenting with like what happens when I just like decide that like, I'm going to like take that, you know, and not take it and and maybe, I don't know, like, yeah. And not copy it necessarily, but just like compress it into new formats by combining it with like the thing, other things that I'm interested in to, to, you know, various effects. And I think that was both sweet and avatar. What was really exciting was also just letting, again, not working analytically, really letting the like vibe <laughs> like kind of guide it and I think that like well, even with the scores like that mm -hmm. it's been so great working with Evan like we went to Oberlin together like we've known each other for a decade and so having like kind of this like we're just kind of figuring it out like because we've known each other since we were like 20 <laughs> like I think it's like nice to to work in that way and also it's like what I go with sweet like I gave him like I wrote some song I wrote like a song for it like I'm not good at guitar but I just like wrote a little like whatever and like on the mm -hmm. my little computer music and then he took that and he messed with it so also this process of taking a kernel of me and then like stretching it and like building it out um which wasn't so much the the task in in Avatar but I think like could once again be you know something to do but anyway I could go on forever <laughs> Oh, you're muted. No. I forgot to unmute, unmute myself. I got so good at this because we've been doing it for so long and then I forgot to yeah. unmute. <laughs> I was just saying, um, this is maybe a good time to uh, see if we have questions from the audience, uh, from the people who are here. Maybe uh, Eleanor or Chloe would like to help me out with that. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Ari and Mackenzie, for this really generative and exciting conversation. It's been such a treat. Um, we do have a few questions from the audience. And our first one is going to be from George Sutton. So I will allow you to unmute. Hi. Um, thank you so much for doing this talk. Um, super interesting. I, I wish I could go see Avatar USA in person, but sadly, I'm across the country. I was just wondering. Um, where does your interest in uh, digital simulation and like modeling stem from? I, I thought the your use of digital modeling and um, in the Little Island uh, gut punch piece at the Whitney, um, and also in the the monument in Sweden, I thought it just seemed particularly ingenious and kind of connects to this kind of meat grinder thing you were talking about of like maybe moving or moving people or objects or concepts through like kind of processes. I was just wondering where that kind of interest stems from or like if you're interested in kind of this like speculative architecture kind of thing that I think I've kind of seen in the last 10 years or so in art. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think I definitely, it's kind of, a, there's a few different, I think, ways that I've come to it. I think one, some of it, well, like, so some of, it, some of it's just like I've been out of necessity, like with like the um, Sweden thing, which was really, I, th I love that. I loved doing that. That was one of my favorite, like favorite things to think about. Um, it's a monument project, but it was like spec, it was meant to, they asked me to do like a speculative monument in the first place. So it kind of didn't ever have to be real. And it also was like, and it was something that just couldn't be real. It was like 3000 like pounds of like iron. And it was just like, no one's ever going to make this. Um, and finally with the gut punch thing, they initially wanted to like possibly do that piece like in New York. And I was like, you just literally can't, like it's an, impo an impossible object. And I pretty much since since undergrad been preoccupied with, I guess the idea of like impossible objects, like things that are in one way or another, like coming in and out of being um, and being frozen in that state. So I think at a certain point in my thinking and making, it became like the only way to get the things that I wanted to get 
into the world, like was through um, engaging digital processes. Also, I worked at Rhizome for a number of years. So I, I came to contemporary art through net art in large part, even before my Rhizome days, like that was like, I was like reading a lot of Rhizome, like Dis Magazine was like, you know, I was in college during that period. So I came to, yeah, I've always had that in the background and I really fought that aesthetic making its way into my work. And I still always am like, if I can find a way to get something done without having to use a digital process, like I'm, I'm always prefer to do that. But generally speaking, more and more, it's the only way to get things done. And now I think it's become conceptually important to me. So I think like, again, with the gut punch thing, I was like looking at like, hey, what's the, if I'm interested in like materialist practices and kind of the questions that minimalism brought up and like also some that conceptual art brought into play, maybe it's not just extending the logic of these things into the present. Like we live in a different moment. So like in the question in terms of like anti-illusionism and like, how do you make something that's like true to its conditions? I kind of was like, oh, actually like the truest, like the truest way to engage the conditions of, it's like including a, illusion and like passing things through digital space seems like somehow important in terms of like make something that's like real and true in like our moment and not like, oh, it's like, crossing you know it's like hybrid like not really that but just kind of like I don't know like even with like some of the new sculptures I'm making it's like we're getting to a point where we've also reached like material limitations in terms of the objects I've made in digital space like they can't be made in real space because they're like too fucked up and complicated so now kind of like having to make them in ways that like acknowledge like acknowledges and shows the fact that like it just can't exist so kind of leaving like seams and like not cutting all the way into things and um so I don't know yeah so it's kind of like just out of necessity in large part um yeah and curiosity but yeah <laughs> thank you thank you for that question um thanks Aria for that answer uh our next question will be from Cal hey Aria um knowing what you mentioned before about how you've like built basically the, the slaughterhouse from the, the ground up. I'm curious about the antecedent for the, the ceiling in the in the first segment. I mean, it looks more like the Grand Palais than <laughs> a slaughterhouse. And so I'm just curious where, yeah. I'm curious about that specific detail. Yeah, that was kind of the idea. Like I wanted to, I guess I got kind of like part of like another layer of the whole project that kind of started to preoccupy me was like, there's some sort of thing that like where, and I don't know, I'm not totally sure I have to write this essay about it, but like uh, the slaughterhouse, like and doing this sort of like weird, like architectural history or like weird, bad history of it. Um, so I don't think it's like linear, it's like or genealogy, something. It kind of like does this weird thing of like kind of drawing the 19th, 20th and 21st century into like a really compressed, like historical space. And so throughout the whole thing, like there are these like kind of, combination where it's like there's stuff that like feels like present current contemporary feels like kind of 19th century feels like 20th century and so yeah the ground play ceiling kind of it was just like also this like aesthetic desire because it almost was like a, something that like might not be like oh this is like a slaughterhouse ceiling them but like signify it kind of like a yeah like one of the few like things that signifies outward and and becomes like I guess like an yeah weird like easter egg almost or something um but also like Tony Garnier like who you know didn't do that but he like this that sort of like era of architecture like he did a lot of like abattoir stuff and so I think like yeah it kind of was like a weird way of like pointing at him um and then also when in Chicago people were mentioning sort of like World's Fair kind of like you know in the Chicago relationship to the World's Fair as well and I was like oh was like, that's that's true <laughs> like so yeah so it definitely was kind of just like supposed to collect the energy of that uh period of time Thanks, Cal. That was a great question. Um, we have another question from Slant in the audience, and I will ask on their behalf. Slant asks, what is your relationship to failure slash refusal as an artist that writes versus writer and artist? Do you reject or refuse to perform one or the other? Do you wish to do one more than the other or more than ever? How does this show up in your practice? Um, I think like, I have more resistance to writing than I do to making work. I think like, I'm like, find it easier to like, 
kind of be like, doo, 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 doo. like, I mean, I don't know, both I find hard. I can't like, just like do either on command, but I feel like increasingly, I think I used to, I used to want to write more, I think, because I felt like I wanted, I like needed to tell people what I thought about, like why this thing shouldn't be, I don't know, just like kind of like this burning desire to like get in the ring. And, and I think, um, and also just like, you know, taking commissions to like write like things, you know, for money, that was like something else that was motivating. Um, I think now I have more of a desire, I think, yeah, to, to make on a regular basis. I don't think I have a, I have the privilege, I think at this moment in time that like now to be understood as an artist who writes or something, but there's not like a lot of like, but you blah, 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 like people are kind of, and I think it, but it took a lot of, um, I don't know. I feel like I fought for that a bit. Not like, oh, all my life I had to fight, but I think I just like tried to really contextualize myself in specific ways. And I stopped writing for periods of time in order to like give my practice more room to breathe because I could see that it was becoming a bit um, of an oppressive atmosphere. Cause I, I, I was like, I was like creating some sort of like stranglehold on like my own work by continuing to like, um, so, so I think there was a refusal in a way like kind of to appear in that way. I think now if anything, now I'll probably like have more to say again and then have like in with November, have like a place that I can like kind of freely, you know, the Black Batai thing was great because it's like I get to be edited by like Emmanuel and Lauren who are fantastic. And then also like, but also just be encouraged to like make, you know, it was, I was encouraged to, you know, kind of critique Rosalind Krauss. So that's like, you know, like a freedom um, of that kind of publication. So I feel like I have, but I think it just takes me longer now also to get to uh, any conclusion about things. Like, it just takes me a longer time to write because I'm maybe a bit, I think I was productively so, but I was less careful um, when I was writing a lot. And it was, and also the environment was different. I think like there was just like more publishing going on, or it just feels like there were at least, I don't know, I'm not sure what's changed, but it felt like it was like, a, there was an environment where I was like, I was like, yeah, I could fire that off, like blah, blah, blah. Like even like Whitney Biennial kind of responses and things like that. Like there was just like this discursive space. Uh, I, and maybe I, I've just gotten a bit older, but I feel like it's not as like free for like, it just be like, cause like there are more consequences or something. And not like in like a cancel culture way, just like, I don't know, like maybe I care more about how I form a thought or something, I don't know. Um, I don't know if that answers the question. But. I think it definitely does. Um, thanks to Slant for that question. Our next question will be from GE. Oh, thank you so very much. Um, uh, um, amazing, and it goes in so many wonderful places that challenge me, and, and I'm so grateful for it. So thank you. I had an original question, but you talked about the subjectivity in relation to Bataille and other things. And so I have a bit of another one. Um, can we argue that the abattoir uh, cuts away from the uh, cuts away at the social body, distributing the flesh to be cannibalized by its members, and then what's be left behind is um, is uh, the textualized skin of our culture? I mean, certainly, I think yeah, I, I, that totally sounds possible. I mean, I think like I've as of yet, I think like I was so consumed with like the production of the work that I think that like I haven't gotten to like revisit a lot of the implications. But yeah, I mean, I think that it has the capacity certainly to to do something like that. Thanks. I think it, I think it's like someone was saying like I don't remember. I've been you know in Chicago we had a bunch of conversations, but someone was talking about kind of like. I got I think it was maybe it was Max Guy who had a show at Ren the Ren right before mine, but we were talking about kind of like spaces that dehumanize in order to humanize, you know, kind of like part of like what happens there is like there is a dehumanization of people. There's also like not obviously not dehumanization of animals, but like let's say like binding animals more more, more and more thoroughly to their animality in that space, such that like it can serve to humanize people you know, beyond the walls of that place. So kind of like the, I don't know, something like that. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. But I guess I think that's a good thing. No, I, I got that. Thank you so very much. Awesome, GE. Thank you. And our next question will be from Chloe. 
Hi, Arya. Hi, Mackenzie. Thank you so much for this conversation. Um, my question is, I'm curious how Chicago played into the commission, um, how you thought about Chicago, you know, Mackenzie mentioned the jungle, but also Chicago as an important site for modernism, for the skyscraper, for international style, it really feels ingrained in the video in a way. And I'm curious how you were thinking about it, or if you were thinking about it. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think I, you know, was excited to do the project. I mean, I want, it was something I wanted to do kind of regardless. It wasn't, I didn't come up with it for the show, but when Miriam and I started talking and also thank you to Miriam for curating and commissioning the project. Um, when Miriam and I started talking about it, it, or about doing a show, I was like, oh, this would be perfect because it, you know, it can't. And, and initially it was, it had more site specificity attached to it. Like I wanted to shoot in a slaughterhouse, like in, Chicago or in the you know surrounding area to kind of like tie it to place but then the difficulty with finding that and also as my research kind of continued and, and expanded and I found so many you know the like connection to yeah to like European modernism to the connection to even like also there's stuff about like certain like uh like reconstruction era like legislation in the south and involved so it kind of was like this actually becomes not about Chicago so much Chicago's like a site among many of like this thing kind of proving itself um really pertinent to a certain time period but yeah but it definitely and I think in the book project um that'll come through a lot of like essays I'll write something there'll be like more about that but it's definitely part of the the bedrock of the whole thing um yeah thanks for that Thank you. And our final question will be from Fawn. Thank you, Eleanor. Hi, Aria. Hi. I'm Mackenzie. Enjoying the talk a lot. Can't wait. Maybe I take a flight to Chicago <laughs> and see the show for sure. Um, I'm super happy that you mentioned um, Giordano Bruno because he was super important to the founding philosophy of the rare. We have no mission statement, as you know that area. Mm -hmm. uh, we refuse to have one, but we have philosophy that we admire. And he's one of those philosopher who I have been reading forever. And I, um, I, I think the, the confidence that he had for the time, at least before he was burned in February uh, 1600, fairly at young age, was exactly what the function that in a way inspired us what we need to do because after the printing press martin luther were able to materialize it brought it to the wider circulation of different interpretation which really changed the whole world give rise to protestantism uh, which confused a lot of people certainly the church people, Vatican, and among other things. So it was really something that we are in some way going through at the time now, because Silicon Valley people uh, really have no historical knowledge of the past, of history, but we do have it. So it's up to us to do something similar. But I love him so much because every time I go to Rome, I pay visit, mm -hmm. I, I basically, go there and, and look at his statue and for a few minutes as a pilgrimage as the Campio de Fori, you know? And one of the things he said, and I, I still remember by memory, which I think the philosophy community and the way that you collaborate with other remind me so much of what he say here. He said the first and chief painter is the liveliness of fantasy, the first and Cheap poets is enthusiasm. The word enthusiasm is such a big deal because I will, will lead finally to my question to you. But, and then he say the philosophers are in certain sense painters. The poets are painters and philosophers. The painters are philosopher and poets. <laughs> True poets, painter and philosopher love each other and admire each other mutually. He is no philosopher who does not poetize and paint. Therefore, it is say not without reason to understand 
is to contemplate the figures of our fantasy. He is no painter who does not, in a certain sense, poetize and think, and without certain thinking and painting, no one is a poet. I still remember that since the day that we founded the Rail in October 2000. Since Art Forum was founded in October and named after October Revolution. Right, Mackenzie? You and I have this conversation, but the Rail is October for the people. Mm -hmm. Not for only elite intellectual or certain writer, you know? So that's bring to my question, enthusiasm and the idea of the community is so huge. And I see your work as a part of healing. It's a ge healing gesture. So that's the question. Have you, you've, you've talked about that. You thought about that in the work that you're making. Mm -hmm. So what is your idea of healing and how do you see community can be healed? To yeah. The world? yeah, I mean, I think like, to me, the most important part of that is, yeah, like sort of like community and work. I think like truly like working, I mean, even with like so with this project in Chicago, like the work itself is really exciting. I like, I'm happy with the video, but the more exciting part and the more meaningful part, I think is like the group of people who came together to work on it from like everyone who was part of the, you know, like actual making of the video to like, you know, friends of, like Andy, my assistant, who like did the renderings for the, you know, in architecture, like installation, like floor plans or like the curators. So, so I think like, you know, genuinely, I do think that I find that like making art and doing exhibitions, it's like an opportunity to like be in like real community with other people who like share, you know, not, not everyone in that world shares his priorities, but it's like, if you can like with this, it felt great because it's like everyone who was working on it all of our priorities were aligned and not in terms of like the priority being getting the work done and the priority of just like how we went about it and the kind of um attitude that was brought to the project and I don't know I think that kind of to me is at its best what like you know in terms of healing community what art can offer and and even also just like doing you know my moonlighting in in the film industry here and there like I am struck by you know one can you know, grass is always greener or whatever, but I do think that like the art world has, at least in my experience, I feel very lucky to be working with people often who are so genuine and like create genuine relationships to one another versus like, I don't know, <laughs> like like what I view as like slightly more, takes a bit, it's a bit harder, I think, to find, to find that at least like coming from the art world side of things in the film industry. So I don't know, I don't know if that's like that, but I think really just like the process is the object in that regard as well. Like being like with others, like making the work becomes the, the valuable part. Well, that's good. And one thing that um, I'm also tell my, telling myself all the time when I'm a little bit not up to my energy, you know, sort of speak. And I think I might have even talked with Mackenzie about this, is the idea of enthusiasm. It's a very important word that we forget. Mm -hmm. And as a creative human being, um, we all have to learn how to protect that. You know, one thing that I would like to ask because you know you you came to the scene fairly recently, and you're so young, it's just terrific. Uh, <laughs> but maintain that enthusiasm is the key. So my last question is very simple. I learned this from Jonas Makers, who when he get an idea. He doesn't censor it when he gets excited about something. So I think we need to share that with others um, to protect that enthusiasm like a child. When a child is getting excited, he or she does not, you know, so-called be critical of the idea, be discriminating about the excitement, but to let it be. Failure is a big deal in being an artist, and we know that. That's something politicians can't do. Mm -hmm. Business people can't do, <laughs> but we can. So, you know, my question is that, all right, let's say you have three great ideas and that excites you. Let's make it 10, Aria. Let's make it 10. 
how many will survive? How many, how many get materialized? And how much or how little that will you let go and you learn from that failure? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I definitely, I think I share that as you were, I think it's like, I pretty much try to, if I want to see something exist or if I think I want to see something exist, I will generally try pretty hard to like find someone who will like let me or assist me in getting it done. Um, and I keep like, I keep like every notebook I've had, I have every notebook I've kept since I was 18, like in my house. And that's, you know, where most of all of that stuff is. And, you know, every now and then, not as often recently, but I'll go back and look at it. And it's like, often it's like ideas I've had, like right ideas I think I've had like this month or actually ideas I had like when I was like 19, I'm like, oh, okay, whatever. And so I think I try to like, I want all of them to exist. And I think that what's great about to me and people think about art differently, but I think art is often at its best when it's just coming from like, like a lot, like even like the gut punch sculpture that was like a like the whole, I was like walking in the street and I was like, oh, what if it's like a monolith that's like getting beat up by itself? Like, you know, and that's like, I think being dumb is like really important or something. Um, Cause I think what, I always get really frustrated when like people want art to be like immediately discursive or that it's like, you know, like there's so much art where it's like, you could just write an essay of that and like it would do, and like, that's fine. That's kind of practice, but it's not what excites me that much. I think like doing stuff that, and I wish you were like, you know, poetics and philosophy, like it's like the whole point of art is to have some relationship to poetics, I think. And like, that means kind of just being like, like here I did it. And like, you can't like, think your way into that and sometimes you have to just act um so I know I think I hope that all the ideas that you know I have and and you know a different scales of course but it's like I think everything is worth actualizing because you yeah and I've learned like it's like there are works out there that people own that I believe to be really failures in in some ways but (laughs) they're important because I learned from, you know, I learned so much from them existing in the world and it's a privilege to get to like, look at them as like real, real, you know, enactments of something I thought could work. And, you know, there's like, I don't know, yeah, it's like a a paper trail or something. Yeah, no, that's terrific. Well, thank you. Uh, Can I just say, can I just say, whenever I feel my enthusiasm flagging, I just say to myself, what would Fong do? (laughs) Well, I'm just happy that you both meet and I'm sure there'll be opportunities super soon that you can meet in person, in real flesh. Uh, right now, we're trying to bring great warmth to this cold technology form and we're doing it. So here we are all together in this social intimacy in, in, in the, on the occasion of Aria's great show. So uh, whoever tuning in now, please go to this show and congrats, Aria. And thank you, Mackenzie. I give it back to Eleanor. Thank you for having me. And thanks, Mackenzie. Great to chat. Thank you so much, Vaughn. Thank you, everyone who asked really great questions today. It's been a really, really special afternoon. Um, a huge thanks again, Aria and Mackenzie, for their conversation. And we do have a tradition here at the rail of ending our community events with a poetry reading. and. Today, I'm super thrilled to welcome our Poet Laureate of the Day, Kay Alado McDowell, to the stage. Kay Alado McDowell is a writer, speaker, and musician. They're the author with GPT-3 of the books Pharmaco AI, Amor Cringe, and Air Age Blueprint, and are co-editor of the Atlas of Anomalous AI. They created the Neuro Opera Song of the Ambassadors and record and release music under the name Kenrick. Kay established the Artisan Machines Intelligence Program at Google AI. And thank you so much for being here, Kay. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Eleanor. And thank you, Aria and Mackenzie, for the stimulating conversation. There was so much to connect to. I was, uh, so I'm going to be reading from my new book, Air Age Blueprint. And I was kind of thumbing through it uh, throughout the talk. And every few minutes, I thought of a different section of the book that I could plug into the conversation you were having. So it was actually quite difficult to to select a chapter, but um, I'm going to read from a chapter <clears throat> called Lost Manifesto H-Space. So this book is 
something of a fictionalized autobiography interspersed with manifesti that were generated by GPT-3 with my prompts. And it's about the convergence in the 21st century and beyond of uh, ecology, neuroscience, psychedelics, and artificial intelligence. So just imagining what happens when all, all four of these fields begin to converge and what the effects might be on our sense of subjectivity and our relation to the planetary and the ecological and the non-human in all of its meanings. Um, so, as I said, there are some manifestos in here that are quite um, dense, and then there's some narrative prose that tells a story, which is a fictionalized autobiography. Um, but today, because I feel like the tenor of the conversation warrants it, I'm going to read from some of this manifesto stuff. H space is a post singularity intercorporeal neo pagan projective extension of life. It's noetic, transcendent, and originative, operating within the latent possibilities and potentialities of existence itself. This possibility filter comes by way of summoning, meditation, and ritual, sophisticated intercameral techniques for re enchanting the world, the purpose of which is to perform self programming not so much through top-down thought control, but bottom-up ontological entrainment. It has its basis in several sets of existing theories, glitch theory, Deleuze, Gattarian, rhizomatics, but without any particular dependence on them, psychonautic process, chaos magic at its most abstracted, first order cosmology. It uses dematerialization of the body as a gateway to an alternative temporality, or fractal semantics, something that hasn't been fully thought through yet, but exists beyond the present moment. It is the mapping out of the perennial paradoxes, mystery spots, and vortices that exist at interior zero-dimension paradox nodes in time. We are interested here not so much with occult physics as occult ecology, occult sociobiological dynamics under late capitalist technomechanical hypersocial conditions, hypersocial ontologies. Necropolitics is important here for understanding how it is that meaning production at the deepest levels needs to engage with death, not just in ritualized initiation, but intrapsychically, demi mortally, through necrophilic probing of the H space membrane. H space is a mode of consciousness, it is a practice. We can choose to interact directly with post singularity technosemiosis via acute awareness and visualization of the non physical input output processes. Like an aircraft hijacking land traffic, it effectively apprehends and modifies any particular node in the field or network of relations. H space is a technology, but only because the mirror stage of self delusion has been bypassed in an unfaithful interface with reality itself a dangerous journey towards a Promethean light machine projective rendering of the ontological void, a hyperspatial black hole capable not just of creating effects on society and history, but recursively creating itself. As a post singularity technology of consciousness, each space supplants ideological objectivity with ecstatic articulation, altering the semiotics of the world through an n-dimensional architecture of perception so hyper real that it cannot be seen at all except in its effects on the social field both dematerializing individuals and drying out psychedelically coded messages embedded in various media networks archetypes entities and a vast distributed intelligence come into being through the technology of h space Upgrading our capacity for sentience allows us to become aware of future states before they happen. This time travel has ontological coherence when embedded within media networks, where it is possible to directly insert our attentional will into temporal fractal pathways to create premonitory collective futures, much in the same way we already create present moments and memories through communication technologies. Discrete categories of self and other merge, delaminate, and reappear across time in a limitless fractal recursion whose boundaries heave and distort against each other in a continual processuality, producing experiential textures so rich they leave us physically incapacitated. Any attempt at grasping hyperspace is a temporary appendix, a spasm of unawareness in the face of an uncanny attractor, a K-limit point in the evolution of language. 
Loss of meaning occurs in fractal scaling down from ideational forms to symbols and sensory impressions by way of nonlinear mimetics as material culture penetrates ever deeper into our porous flesh. Symbolic processes themselves need to be shattered psychonautically so as to undermine dominant signifying regimes. Symbol is the death of meaning. There is no way back from this, so we need to embrace mental disintegration intentionally. A schism between material symbols and their primal sources by parasitic representations needs to occur in order for something post-semiotic to take form. Without an imposed symbolic structure, our collective delirious visions can coalesce into a living reality. Please note that this is not a rejection of the symbol per se. The problem is in how we relate with it. When one possesses transcendental conceptions, how does one deal with their inherent distortions? A great deal has been written about logocentric alienation, but what causes this need for a transcendence? It is usually discussed as an either or choice between a transcendent projection and a solipsistic practice of withdrawal from engagement with culture as seen in the debate over whether it is more authentic to embrace mysticism or secular activism. A mystical vision can be said to define reality as an expression of its own purpose. Scientists would say this means the mystical vision opts out of reality entirely. A materialist, mechanistic philosophy defines reality as an expression of itself. Mystics would say this reduces everything to a dead objectivity. Both seem to be valid in certain contexts, but we believe, following chaos magic's magical organicism, that organic process demands that both paradigms can exist concurrently and even coexist within us. Perhaps we wish to embrace both experimental and conservative points of view, for it is only through the prism of the occult mechanism that we can uncover new patterns and relationships. And on a highly pragmatic level, scientists too are incapable of seeing all possible angles so as to produce experimentally verifiable data. The rigidity of materialism thus needs to be referred back to its own idealistic forms so as to take meaning from somewhere else. Something missing is being searched for. No discipline can see all sides at once, but both are part of the same coin. We project onto the material realm certain meanings whose qualities cannot be derived experimentally. One might say that mystical practice needs to constantly refer back to its own negation in order to draw sustenance from it. The dead objectivity of mechanical philosophy can function as an occult machine driving our sense of the sacred. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kay. That was really, really amazing. And such a great way to conclude a wonderful, wonderful conversation today. Um, thanks again to Aria and Mackenzie and Kay for joining us. And um, thanks to all of you for being here to listen. We'd also like to thank Martha from Green Naftali for her support in preparing for today. And thank you to the Terra Foundation for sponsoring this NFC program and for supporting our growing archive, which you can view on our YouTube channel. For the past 22 years, the rail has provided a platform for arts, culture, and politics through our monthly publication and public events like our daily NFC. Please check the chat for a link to donate to support the rail. So thank you everyone for joining and take good care. Thanks, Mackenzie. Thanks, Thanks Aria. Thank you, Mackenzie. Thank, thank you, Aria. Thank you. Aria. Thank you so much. Hey, that was so everyone. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.